I threw together a presentation here that while you're, I'm going to be talking about men that were from Martin, lived in Martin, moved to Martin at various, various times, that uh, in my opinion, 1940s, these men had, and I keep saying men because I didn't have any women uh, to do, but uh, that, you know, we're probably down here at this, this Four Corners area. Uh, so as I'm talking about this stuff, and for you guys that are students, whether you've had American history, uh, whether you're going to have American history, world history, you're going to be talking about some of these, these battles from World War I that I'm going to talk about one of our, our residents was in, World War II, the Civil War. You know, I'll be talking about Shiloh and Gettysburg, Gettysburg uh, play, th uh, names that you should still remember from Mrs. Monroe's eighth grade class. Um, now, I did not put in my presentation anyone that was still alive or anyone that has recently passed away. So there are some individuals in our township that I know personally that are still alive that have done some pretty cool heroic things. But I did not put them in the presentation. We have a lot of veterans that are in Martin Township. Uh, if you go to East Martin Cemetery, for example, I mean, we've got 36 veterans just from the Civil War in East Martin Cemetery. You know, and then we have 20-something in South Martin Cemetery. That's just one, one war there. So World War II, we have a lot. Uh, I'm only covering one World War II person, and that's because he was killed in action during World War II. Uh, but if someone has just recently passed away, uh, I didn't want any uncomfortable situations if I spoke about them, and I definitely didn't want one if somebody was still alive. Because there are veterans that kind of want to keep that stuff quiet. Now, the first thing that I do want to, to talk about is Veterans Day and Memorial Day. I think there is a little bit of confusion with Memorial Day in May and Veterans Day on November 11th. Memorial Day, what are the beginnings of Memorial Day? Actually, we don't even really know. We've got it narrowed down to certain things, and uh, James Redpath is one of those. Started in the latter part of the 1800s after the Civil War, but there's no one date, time, event you can put your finger on and go, aha, that was when Memorial Day started. Memorial Day, the purpose of that is to honor the war dead, to memorial, to remember them. That's why on Memorial Day, families go out and decorate graves, things of that nature. It's kind of morphed into now if you go with your moms and dads or you take your kids with you, you go out and you do mom's grave and dad's grave, grandma's, everybody's. That's not the true intent of Memorial Day. Memorial Day is just supposed to be for the war dead, but it has morphed into what it is today. Veterans Day, which is November 11th, which is the Saturday, we can put our finger on an exact time, an exact date, an exact reason that Veterans Day started, and that is to honor all veterans. It started in 1918, at the end of World War I, and it was called Armistice Day. And it was on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month. It's when the peace treaty was signed, or the ceasefire happened for World War I. And that was Armistice Day. And then eventually in the 1950s, after World War II, they said, hey, what about the rest of us? Korea was just starting to end, World War II was over, so Congress just changed it to Veterans Day to honor all American veterans, not just the World War I. So, we are going to be looking at a Veterans Day presentation. There are some war dead that are going to be in here. But we're going to be looking at Martin individuals. And, like I said, I want you guys, especially the younger guys here, the younger men, men and women here. These people lived in the same town, same township that you did. I mean, heck, if you live in an old farmhouse, there's a good chance that maybe one of these people that was their farm, okay? Because I know some of the farmhouses are still there. 
So, you know, this is just kind of a, a, a fun thing for us as Martin people to go through and take a look at. Now, Allegan County started getting settled about 1833, 1834. Martin Township got settled in 1836. Veterans played a key role in this. They didn't have to fight for it, but the War of 1812 is a reason why many of the early veterans came here to Allegan County and to Martin Township. They didn't get paid for their service in the War of 18. They got an IOU from the government for land that could be called in at any time. And the, the United States was expanding westward. Kentucky was being settled, Indiana, Michigan, Wisconsin, so several of these people that called in their IOUs came here to Michigan. This is an example, let me go to the next slide because this is an example of our guy. Ichabod Green was from New York. He was in the 29th U.S. Infantry stationed in Burlington, Vermont during the War of 1812. And when his time, Burlington, Vermont, I won't get into the War of 1812 too much, even though I'd, I'd love to. Uh, we'd be here all night. You guys wouldn't want the extra credit for that. So, um, uh, but Burlington, Vermont was kind of a key hub for U.S. forces because the Brits, British were in Canada. So that was kind of a key, key staging area. And so Ichabod Green from New York was actually stationed in Burlington, Vermont. After the war, he called in his IOU and he received something very similar to this. I know it's going to be kind of hard to see without uh, the lights on. This is an actual, and I'll have these up front so you can see afterwards. This is a land certificate. You can see Franklin Pierce's name right there. This is from 1853. And the soldier received this for land. And here, is, and this is a, one for our county, but it's not Ichabod Green's. But you can see it actually says the southwest quadrant of this section of this and all that. It just tells him what area in the county was his. And at the very top, it says for his service in the War of 1812. And it actually says what company he was in and what militia and all that. So Ichabod Green received one of these. I wish I had Ichabod Green's, uh, but uh, as I was talking early to Alicia that his, or Denise, one of you two, that his has probably gone to the sands of time. More than likely, it doesn't even exist anymore. But this is the actual document uh, for, for a, a War of 1812 soldier to come here to Allegan County. Like I said, Ichabod Green was stationed, uh, stationed in Burlington, Vermont. I, I saw his military records, and he spent most of his time sick, uh, which is going to be a theme for our early ones. Sickness. Which brings me to... Samuel Page, buried at East Martin Cemetery. Ichabod Green is also buried in East Martin Cemetery. Uh, Samuel Page was a doctor in both the Mexican-American War and the Civil War. Okay? They're, like I said, our theme. 1836, the whole Alamo thing. Texas separates from Mexico. Mexico didn't like it. Mexico still said Texas was part of them, even though they were a republic. We jump forward to 1846. And you guys in history, U.S. history, who's got U.S. history right now? Did you just finish up the Mexican, uh, Mexican American War? Or are you still talking about it? Still talking about it. 1846 to 1848, Mexican American War, and Mexico did, didn't like the fact that uh, Texas was still calling itself its own its own country because Mexico is still considered a state. So the United States annexes. Texas and says, hey, you're a part of the United States now. That really set Mexico off. We were not ready for a war. Medically, we were not ready for a war because we didn't have enough surgeons. People like Samuel Page, who was a doctor, joined the army. They were so desperate for surgeons and, and medical folks that they were taking people that only had two years worth of experience. Now, one of the problems for the Mexican-American War and the Civil War Disease. We didn't understand germs. Doctors were actually referred to slangly as butchers because if you got shot in the leg, they fixed it by cutting your leg off. Uh, disease was unknown. They didn't understand that you had to put your drinking water separate from where you went to the bathroom. So cholera, dysentery, diseases like that, which we'll find out when I talk a little bit about the Civil War, was pretty bad. But Samuel Page, 
who I cannot find any of his information here in the township. He's buried in East Martin Cemetery, and I know he lived here somewhere in the township. I think I have all the records for the doctors that were in Martin Corners at the time, and he ain't one of them. So he was here somewhere. Somewhere in the township he was here, but I can't find much information on him at all, except for the fact that he was a doctor in both the Mexican-American War and, and the uh, Civil War. But think about that for, for you guys, because all of you students here that are, that are in eighth grade or past eighth grade, uh, you have had the Civil War, and I know Mrs. Monroe talks about disease, and the medicine that this guy practiced right here. Like I said, if you got shot in the leg, they cut it off. If you got shot in the arm, they cut it off. And they usually did it in a barn on top of a piece of wood that uh, the animals were, were still in the room. So then you get infection, uh, you know, things of that nature. But, you know, the, the things that this guy saw, because, you know, these people traveled out of their comfort zone. I mean, if you lived in the 1800s, even into the 20th century, if you lived in Martin Township, a big travel day for you would have been going to Kalamazoo. That was an event. I mean, that was a, there were people that lived their whole life in the 1800s in Martin Township and never went more than 10 miles away from their house. You know, and so you get a guy like this that they send him all the way to Texas, you know, to fight against the fight against the Mexicans in the war. So that was a big journey for someone like him. Now he was educated, but even then, that was a huge journey. And that's one of the things I want you guys to understand. You know, today you travel, you go to Florida on vacation, you go to your grandma's house in New York, you go to Canada, you go to the UP, uh, you get on airplanes, we fly all over. That was unheard of a hundred years ago. You just didn't do that stuff. You didn't, in traveling, you had to have money, and that was a big deal. It took forever to get anywhere, so it was uh, that was a big deal. Next, we're going to talk about the Civil War. If you guys have questions while I'm talking, don't don't be shy. Did they have field hospitals and general hospitals back then? They they had field hospitals. They called them field. The big ones were the field hospitals. Okay, there was usually three tents. That's a very good question. Usually there were three big tents. And then they got smaller depending on how further away you got from the regiment. Uh, and the further away you got from the regiment, the less qualified your doctor was. Um, and, you know, he had to deal with alcoholism. You know, the troops were drunk all the time. Uh, you know, he had to deal with cholera, dysentery. you would have a whole tent full of people that were, you know, releasing all bodily fluids in all directions. Uh, Civil War. Allegan County has a very unique story with the Civil War, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. Now, we had, Allegan County, we had men in just about every Michigan unit, but there seemed to be three particular units that Allegan County had a, the bulk of their people in. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about those three, but then I'm going to talk about some of the other units that we had folks in. Now, these are people that I'm focusing on Martin Township. So when I mention names, I'm talking about somebody that lived right here in our township. Uh, the 19th Infantry, 4th Michigan, and the uh, 4th Michigan Cavalry, and the 1st Michigan Engineers and Mechanics, which is a very unique unit. There were only 10 of them total in the Union Army, and three of them were... Uh, the 1st Michigan, the 1st New York, and the 1st Missouri Engineers Mechanics they actually had engineers in the unit. There was only three of those units. Their job was building bridges, fixing things, fixing telegraphs, tearing up railroads, uh, you know, Confederate railroads, uh, and, uh, and also doing courier with, with messages. First one I'm going to talk about is the 19th Michigan Infantry. Now you're going to notice that all of the men from Allegan County, which Martin's a part of that, were in Company B. The way the states, because each state got orders from the federal government to raise so many men. So Michigan was told you will raise X number of men, you will raise X number of regiments. So what they did is when they recruited, for example, the 19th Michigan Infantry, which was uh, formed up in Dwajak, when they recruited these guys, they took everybody from Allegan County and made them one company. 
So Kent County was one company, Kalamazoo County was one company, etc. And so for the 19th Michigan, everybody was Company B. So they all knew each other. And Martin Township, I'll show you how many people were in Company B from Allegan County. But the 19th Michigan Infantry, we're going to be talking about Cyrus Wheeler, uh, who was killed in action with the 19th Michigan, and I'll tell you about him a little bit later. Barry Nice Martin Cemetery, you can see the Pillars Farm back there in the background. <laughs> Yeah, the Pillar's dog got to know me real well in the four years I was working in East Martin Cemetery because I'd be out there and he'd come walking up and sit down and I'd pat him and he'd follow me around the cemetery as I'm looking at headstones. Uh, Cyrus Wheeler, this is an 1864 plat map picture. I know it's an eye chart, it's hard to read, but it'll kind of give you a little bit of an idea. There's Lake 16 uh, to give you a reference point. And the Wheeler property was right there. That's A.C. Wheeler. Later on, J.C. Wheeler and his folks all had land all down here. This is, there's Martin Corners right there, and this is 10th Street, and this was all eventually owned by J.C. Wheeler, who we are in his namesake right now, uh, the library. But uh, that's where Cyrus Wheeler, who was the uncle of J.C. Wheeler, that's where he grew up just by Lake 16 there. Um, Robert Patterson, name sound familiar? The older folks probably, yeah. Patterson's Hardware, which is the old, for the younger guys, it's that uh, old, older building right next to the post office. That was Patterson's Hardware. And Robert Patterson started that hardware back in 1893, I think it was, 1894. Uh, fun thing on him, I was doing some research and he actually in 1881 got a, a pension from the federal government of $6 a month because he got shot in the leg. So for the rest of his life, he received a pension of $6 a month. And then uh, David Ogden Brown, bar uh, uh, Patterson's buried in South Martin Cemetery. And one thing too I need to bring up on Patterson, he was the flag bearer for Company B. Okay, I'm gonna talk about flag bearers a little bit later on. But the flag bearer is the one you don't wanna be. He was out front. He was out front with the flag. Because during the Civil War, warfare was much different then. Troops formed up. That's why we still have the tradition in the Army and Marine Corps today where you see them because they're the infantry guys. You see them with their flags, with their company flags and the American flags and all that. Those actually served a purpose back in the 1800s and before that because troops would be able to look up and see where their flags were to know who to line up, where to line up behind. Because the bugler would be calling out orders, the flag bearers would go what direction they were supposed to go, and then the troops would be able to follow them. But the flag bearers always had to be out front. Okay, those were the suicide jockeys. Those were the ones that didn't last very long because you were right out front. Patterson survived that. And I'm going to talk about the 24th Michigan here later on about the flag bearers at Gettysburg. <laughs> Ooh, that was nasty. But Patterson was the flag bearer for the 19th. And I'm going to talk about the 19th a little bit later on, some of the stuff they did, which was pretty amazing, that he survived and only got shot in the leg once. Uh, and then uh, David Ogden Brown, uh, who was a sergeant uh, in the Company B of the 19th, he's buried at East Martin Cemetery as well. He survived the war. Uh, Christy Fontaine, one of Christy Fontaine's relatives, if you guys know Christy. And uh, his farm... Uh, again, this is the 1864 plat map. This is 116th here, and his farmhouse is still there, the one he grew up in on 116, or the one he owned, which is on 116th. These were members from the uh, 19th Michigan. Uh, you can see Cyrus Wheeler here, <coughs> Alva Green, who was a uh, uh, the son of Ichabod Green. He was killed. Uh, Cyrus Wheeler was killed, but you can see how many people from just our township were in. Now, Company B was all Allegan County, and these folks were all just from Martin Township. That's a lot. Alleg Martin Township made up the majority of Company B in the 19th. Now, why do I have the 19th on here? Was it just because I went to the cemetery and saw headstones that said, ooh, 19th, I can do that? No. The 19th 
like I said, formed up into Wajak, eventually made their way down through Kentucky, saw a few skirmishes there, got down to Tennessee. Now, the Battle of Chattanooga was a major battle in the Civil War because whoever controlled Chattanooga controlled the rail lines going into the South. Now, before the Battle of Chattanooga, just across the border, if you ever went to Lookout Mountain and you stood up there and you can see Tennessee, Georgia, and Alabama, Chickamauga is just into Georgia. You can see it from Lookout Mountain. U.S. forces, the Union forces, had gone into Chickamauga chasing the Confederates, but it was a trap. And they got slaughtered and routed. The 19th was a part of that. And the ones that survived were the ones that retreated the fastest back to Chattanooga. Once they got back to Chattanooga, the Confederate forces chased them. We got them at Missionary Ridge, defeated the Confederacy. We controlled Chattanooga, which was the beginning of the end of the war, because now we controlled the rail lines in. The United States had a general named Sherman. I don't know if that rings a bell to you guys. Sherman had the army of, ten of the Tennessee. Now here's a little trivia question for you, something if you're, if you're out and you can earn a nickel from somebody. Confederate armies were named after states. The army of Tennessee, the army of Mississippi, the army of Texas. Northern armies were named after rivers, the army of the Potomac, the army of the Tennessee, the army of the Ohio, the army of the Mississippi. So it was not uncommon, for example, in the Battle of Chattanooga, to have the army of Tennessee fighting the army of the Tennessee. And they were, they were fighting each other. So after we took Chattanooga, the 19th Michigan joined Sherman's army. And if you've ever seen Gone with the Wind, and if you haven't, you need to. If you've ever seen Gone with the Wind, you can see what Sherman's army did. So, Sherman's army went down Kennesaw Mountain, just north of Atlanta. They, they fought all the way down. Kennesaw Mountain uh, was a major battle. Then the siege of Atlanta, Cyrus Wheeler. Sherman's army surrounded Atlanta. Cyrus Wheeler was killed in the Siege of Atlanta. Think about that. A guy from Martin, Michigan, who were sitting in a library named after one of his relatives, was killed in the Siege of Atlanta, which was a major, major battle in the, in, in the Civil War. He saw that. All these men right there that survived saw the K Kennesaw Mountain, saw the Siege of Atlanta, went into North Carolina and fought in North Carolina, marched on Richmond, Virginia, the capital of the Confederacy. And then after the war, they were at the parade in Washington, D.C., in front of the President of the United States. They marched down Pennsylvania Avenue in front of the President of the United States in the Victory Parade. These guys that survived right here from Martin. And they came back here to Martin and did what? They farmed, they opened a hardware store, they just started living life. But think of the things that they saw. Cyrus Wheeler's, uh, I saw the, the message, the, the letter written to the Wheeler family, we've got it at the museum, that described Cyrus Wheeler dying in the siege of Atlanta. And if you want his body, he is buried under a large oak tree south of this little church you know and we put a marker on there so you'll know the families had to go get the body and bring it back and this is before embalming this is why embalming was actually invented was the civil war so they could embalm the bodies just so they could get it back to the families but you don't know, think about the horrors of that and they brought him back here and they buried him at east martin cemetery you know, 150 years ago, 151 years ago, his family stood over there by the Pillars Farm and where the Pillars Farm is now and grieved the burying of their son who probably had never left the township in his life and was saw all of these things with all these other guys and was at the siege of Atlanta where he was killed. 
But that's pretty, that's kind of, it gives, that's kind of stuff gives me goosebumps to think we're a part of that. You guys, your history is a part of that. And I bet, like I said, I bet you a nickel, Cyrus Wheeler at one point in time walked right downtown here in the court. That's where it's always been. You know, he was down there doing something, seeing the doctor, picking up horseshoes, doing whatever. He was doing something. The next one I'm going to talk about is the 4th Michigan Cavalry. Boy, I better hurry up. Jeez. Um, <laughs> 4th Michigan Cavalry, Company L. As I said before, Company L were all men from Allegan County. And we have a very famous person, Andrew B., who was in the 4th Michigan Cavalry, Company L. Andrew B., buried at East Martin Cemetery. Bob Reeds bought his old truck in the background. <laughs> this is a picture of Andrew B., much later in life. Uh, that was, I'm thinking that photograph was around 1880s. He died 1893, so that was kind of towards the end of his life. You see these medals on there? It looks like a Medal of Honor. It's not a Medal of Honor. That's, I get that question all the time to the museum. My grandfather had the Medal of Honor. I got the picture to prove it. No, your grandfather was a member of the Grand Army of the Republic. It was an organization of Civil War, Union Civil War veterans. The Union forces started the Grand Army of the Republic. The Confederate forces started the Ku Klux Klan, okay? Two different organizations. One still exists, one doesn't. Um, but that's a Grand Army of the Republic medal. And Grand Army of the Republics, they had chapters. Martin had their own chapter. There was one in Hopkins. There was one in Allegan. And they would get together. And they, It was the precursor to what we know today as the American Legion. American Legion was started after World War I. Same concept. They could get together. They could talk war stories. The people that were with them, they knew, had seen the same stuff, and they could kind of just get it, get it out of their system. So they'd have meetings every year and conclaves, things of that nature. But Andrew B., May 10th, 1865, the 4th Michigan Cavalry, Company L., headed up by, uh, uh, at that time, Lieutenant Colonel Benjamin Pritchard, who was from Allegan. The Pritchard House is still there. They had fought in the Battle of Chickamauga, uh, they had fought in Chattanooga. They went through Alabama, where Sherman's army went down into Georgia. They battled with Selma. They captured Selma, made it over, the siege of Macon, Georgia. They captured Macon, Georgia, the 4th Cav did. And they got orders. Company L got orders to track down and capture Jefferson Davis, who was the, somebody under the age of 18, except for Austin? President of the Confederacy. Thank you, Hunter. President of the Confederacy. He was the Abraham Lincoln for the South. Now, this is a guy that gave up his U.S. citizenship. Just like, just like Robert E. Lee. They gave up their U.S. citizenship. They said, I don't want to be a U.S. citizen anymore. And as a matter of fact, I'm going to fight against you. So do you think they wanted to capture this guy? Oh, yeah. I mean, most of these men that were in the, in the uh, Union Army were first-generation Americans. They came here to live the American dream. They wanted to be farmers and merchants, and they wanted to have prosperity. And all of a sudden, here's this force in the South that's saying, we don't want to be U.S. citizens anymore, and we want to start our own country. They wanted nothing to do with that. They wanted to say, no, you're not doing that. You're going to be part of us. So they wanted to track this guy down. The 4th Cav got orders to go track this guy down. So they traveled from Macon, Georgia, south, and on their way south, they would send people into the towns dressed in civilian clothes. And they'd just walk in and they'd go, hey, how you doing? What's going on? You know, anything new around here? Finally, they found out through some slaves that were in one of the towns that there was this big encampment outside of Irwinville, Georgia, which even today, when I've been there, it's nothing there's no there's like four buildings there's no stoplight there's nothing there it's all farms it's like being here in Allegan County <laughs> it's there's nothing and it's 25 miles off I-75 two-lane road through soybean fields the whole way so they get to Irwinville Georgia it's early in the morning and they see this encampment now unbeknownst to them the first Wisconsin was on the other side of the camp so they hear this each, the Wisconsin and the Michigan folks hear each other moving around, so they're shooting at each other over the top of the camp. Three guys from the 4th Cavalry get, get killed. And they finally said, oh, gosh, friendly fire, stop, stop. So they get to the camp, 
and there's wagons. Uh, there was a unit of Texas infantry and a unit of uh, Confederate <coughs> Kentucky infantry, because Kentucky was a neutral state, had units on both sides. And they were guarding Jefferson Davis. Now, Lincoln had already been assassinated. Richmond had already fallen. Uh, Lee had already surrendered. The, the war was really over for all intent and purposes, but they wanted to keep it going. So Jefferson Davis was trying to get to New Orleans to get out of the country. So he was coming down from Virginia through Georgia, was going to make his way over through Alabama and then into Mississippi, Louisiana to get out of the country. So the story is, and I'll, I'll give you the real story uh, while, I'm, while I'm telling you what folklore is. So this woman comes out of a tent, and she's got this supposed old lady with her. And she looks at one of the Union forces, well, one of the Union cavalry officers on his horse and says, I've got to get my grandmother out of here. We've got to go get water because all, you know, she needs something to drink because all the shooting has just really gotten her riled up. Andrew B. notices that the thing about Andrew B., they said the one thing he likes is, is looking at people's shoes. He can look at your shoes and tell you kind of what your status is in life, what you do for a living. And he noticed that the old lady was wearing men's riding boots with spurs. So he went, that's not right. Now, at the same time, you're going to hear you guys that have lived here your whole life have probably heard of Corporal Munger. And there's a big debate between Allegan County and Schoolcraft on who's the one that captured Jefferson Davis. Was it Corporal Munger? Or was it Andrew B? Well, the answer is yes. They both did. Corporal Munger was the first one to take his rifle and point it at Jefferson Davis. Andrew B, on his headstone, it says the first man to lay hands on Jefferson Davis. It was a simultaneous action. As Andrew B was grabbing him by the arm, Munger pulled up his rifle and was pointing at him. Okay? So... The answer is yes, we're both correct uh, on that. So they capture Jefferson Davis. Uh, there's a reward, uh, $100,000 bounty was on his head. Ended up going to, uh, uh, took three years. The US Senate actually had to rule on it. We've got the original Senate bill at our museum that says who gets money and how much and, and all of that. But um, so anyway, Andrew B is kind of famous for that. Now, the one thing, and these are some of the political cartoons of the time. The story was Jefferson Davis was wearing women's clothing because when his, that was his wife that took him out of the tent and said, I've got to get my grandmother, you know, we've got to go get some water. He had his wife's shawl on and a robe. He had his own clothes on underneath. But the political cartoons had a heyday with it. So did P.T. Barnum at a circus. He actually had big effigies of Jefferson Davis wearing a hoop skirt, carrying a parasol, and all kinds of stuff. <laughs> but um, uh, these are the, this one, and my favorite one here, oops, wrong way. My favorite one here is this one, because this is actually Andrew B. in the political cartoon. It says, it strikes me your old mother wears very big boots. <laughs> that's, that's supposed to be Andrew B. The corporal that's lifting up the veil on Jefferson Davis, that's actually supposed to be Corporal Munger, he would not have carried a sword. That's a cavalry officer's sword. Corporal Munger was a low-ranking enlisted guy. He, this would have been more of the Corporal Munger there with the rifle. But uh, that's, that's uh, uh, the, one of the political cartoons for the time for the capture of Jefferson Davis. Now, we always talk about Andrew B. 4th Michigan Cavalry captured Jefferson Davis. Oh, what a great guy. What a hero. We never talk about Henry Smith. Henry Smith was there, but we never give credit. Henry Smith was buried in East Martin Cemetery. He lived in 1906. But yeah, poor Henry Smith, he doesn't get any credit whatsoever. He was there. He got money just like Andrew B. did, and, every, you know, and everybody else at the Senate said to get money. But yeah, you never hear about poor Henry Smith. That's, uh, that was Henry Smith's land right there. And again, Lake 16, he, was, he had all this land right there. This is the 1873 plat map, which the library has a reproduction of the 1873 plat map you can look at. So after the war, Henry Smith got money. He got part of that bounty. Everybody that was in there got money. 
Look what he bought. He bought about 160 acres of land. So he used his money wisely where Andrew B. drank his. <laughs> okay, Amasa Carpenter, East Martin Cemetery. Uh, Amasa Carpenter, before, oh, this is something I needed, as one of the artifacts I've got here. This was made by Andrew B. He was a tinsmith, and he made this for Robert Patterson, the hardware store. Uh, he made this for Robert Patterson for one of their, uh, for him, Patterson's, him and his wife's wedding anniversaries. So yeah, this is actually a, a usable working pipe <laughs> if you wanted, wanted to smoke tobacco out of tin. We have a lot of Andrew B. I artifacts at the museum. Uh, just a few on display, but a lot of his tinsmith stuff that he made. He worked for Patterson's Hardware when he was sober. <laughs> yeah, he wasn't. No, he got quite a bit of money, and, and the majority of it was spent bragging and buying drinks for people. Uh, Amasa Carpenter. Uh, Amasa Carpenter was a member of the first Michigan Engineers and Mechanics, Company E. So we have a couple guys from Company E that were from Martin Township, again, the county. You were all in one company together. Uh, I mentioned earlier that uh, Company E, or uh, uh, the first engineers, or the mechanics and engineers, there was only a few units in the whole Union Army. Their job was to build bridges. Their job was to tear up enemy railroads, to fix their railroads, to do things of that nature. Kind of like today's comparison would be the CBs in the Navy uh, or in the Army, the combat engineers. You know, that, that kind of job. But uh, he was killed in the Battle of Murfreesboro in Tennessee. Now, the cool thing about Amasa Carpenter is one of the artifacts I have here, and again, these will be on display for after when the lights are on. Prior to going into the Civil War, Amasa Carpenter was the constable for Martin Township. So I have an eight, eight, from the 1850s logbook here with a bunch of Amasa Carpenter's handwriting in it. And this is his arrest that he made and warrants that he served. Uh, and it's kind of fun to go through here. I was spent, I spent a Saturday at the museum one day just going through looking at this and watch, seeing all the warrants he served on, like Thomas Monteith and all the big names that were around here for, Mon Monteith was for disturbing the peace, which back in the 1850s, I don't know what that meant. You know, <laughs> I was shooting his gun or something, I don't know. But that's, that's a fun document. But uh, Amasa B. Carpenter, whose son was also named Amasa, and there was some confusion there when I first started doing this, but his son, we were talking about the uh, Odd Fellows, his son was one of the founding officers for the Odd Fellows in 1881, which was an organization that was here in Martin Township, Independent Order of Odd Fellows. They were all over the country, but our chapter here, he was one of the officers. But uh, Amasa Carpenter... Remember, Chattanooga, if you've ever been through Tennessee, if you've ever been through Chattanooga, very hilly, very Lake Tennessee goes through there, very strategic area. The Confederates were tearing down bridges. The Union needed bridges to go across the river. So companies like the engineers and mechanics, they would build bridges that would go across uh, that they could get their wagons and horses and the men could go across. That's the kind of work they did. But Murfreesboro, Battle of Stones River, is where Amasa a Carpenter was killed. They were very easily killed. They were not trained soldiers in the sense that the infantry guys were. Now, most of these guys in the, in no matter what state you were from, you were just some farmer that they handed you some clothes and a rifle and said, go stand over there. That was kind of your training. You know, they eventually taught you how to march in formation just for purposes that going down the road but they didn't have a whole lot of training. Most of them couldn't read and write. And I meant to bring a document of a uniform issue that's got Andrew B's signature on it, but half of them, they just have an X on there because they can't even read and write. But, um, but uh, the, uh, uh, these guys, it makes sense they were in Tennessee because they were there to build these bridges for Sherman's army. And they weren't trained, so the Confederates knew that and they captured a lot of them, killed a lot of them, and Amasa Carpenter, unfortunately, was one of them. Uh, this is where his land was. You've got Martin Corners here. This is the 1864 map again, and you can see A. Carpenter right there. So that would be 116, 118th going down there. He was down 118th, which is still dirt road, probably from same dirt road from when he lived there. <laughs> Uh, Orson McLeod, 
very, McLeod was a very common name in Martin Township. Uh, a lot of McLeod graves. Uh, a lot of Scottish immigrated here to Allegan County. Most of the Scots came to North Gun Plain and South Martin. That's why Monteith. And I don't know if you knew this or not, but South Martin Cemetery actually used to be called the Scotch Cemetery because that's where all the Scottish people would want to be buried at. Templeton, Monteith, uh, you know, there's McLeods, all the different names. And there's quite a few McLeods in East Martin Cemetery as well. But uh, Orson McLeod ended up living in 1922. He survived. He survived uh, the Battle of Stones River, Battle of Chattanooga, Battle of Chickamauga. Uh, and then eventually they joined up with Sherman's army and worked on the rails on his march to the sea. J.C. Shellman, 12th Michigan Infantry. We don't see too many guys from Martin Township in the 12th Michigan. Battle of Shiloh. Battle of Vicksburg. Shiloh opened up. Shiloh's in uh, western Tennessee. Shiloh opened up the door for the Union forces going into the south along the Mississippi River, getting them down to the Battle of Vicksburg, which is, was the last holding point of the Confederacy on the Mississippi River. All we needed to do was take Vicksburg, and the Union Army controlled all of the Mississippi River, meaning the Confederates could not get any more supplies in the river whatsoever. Vicksburg, Ulysses S. Grant, uh, that was his army. That was the army of the Mississippi. And he was a member of that army. But this, think this guy, J.C. Shellman, saw the Battle of Shiloh, very common name in Civil War, and saw the Battle of Vicks, the Siege on Vicksburg, where we pretty much cut the city off. We had, the Union Army had no supplies either. The reason why they attacked was because we had no more food and no more reinforcements coming in at all. So... Ulysses S. Grant thought, we better do something because we're just sitting here dying. So he did the offensive and eventually took, took the city of Vicksburg. But this guy saw that. You know, he saw these things. You know, it, it just it, it amazes me. Ah, I am going to combine here the 3rd Michigan Cavalry with the 24th Michigan Infantry. Why? Because they were both in the Army of the Potomac. And... The Army of the Potomac saw very famous and the bloodiest battles of the war. The 24th Michigan Infantry and the 3rd Michigan Infantry were parts of this. Uh, Fredericksburg, Chancellorsville, Gettysburg, Battle of the Wilderness. Uh, you know, they, they saw uh, Antietam. <laughs> they saw these awful horrid battles where not just a couple guys are getting shot they were in battles that thousands of guys were getting killed uh you know the battle of gettysburg for example for these two the 24th michigan infantry and i don't know if you're familiar with gettysburg or not but there was a a, a wooded area on the northwestern side of town and it was just a bloodbath for the union forces there the confederates got them and pushed them back the 24th was caught up in that. And I want to show you this here. The 24th Michigan Infantry had 496 officers and men when Gettysburg started. 89 were killed or mortally wounded. 218 were wounded. 56 were captured. That doesn't include the ones that eventually died. Uh, I talked about the color bearers er earlier. Five color bear bearers were killed, and all of the color guard was killed or wounded in, in that battle. They lost their flag. The Confederates captured their flag. The 24th Michigan Infantry flag is hanging up in a museum in North Carolina now because the North Carolina Infantry Unit captured it. But when Abraham Lincoln died, because they had so many casualties from Gettysburg, they were the ones, they actually escorted Abraham Lincoln's coffin back to Illinois because they knew what kind of damage that that unit had had and they wanted to kind of pep them up. They escorted Lincoln's casket back to Illinois and then they were stationed in Illinois for the rest of the war because they were just, they were just destroyed. The 3rd Michigan Infantry, that's kind of a depressing note with the 24th, uh, but 
What I go back to is Luther Pelham, who was in the 24th Michigan Infantry, buried in East Martin Cemetery. Before I get to the... Luther Pelham survived. And six months after he returned from the war, he mysteriously dies. It's interesting. How, how did that happen? He just mysteriously dies six months after he returns from the war. Think of all the things he saw. He saw his unit destroyed in Gettysburg. He saw a defeat in Chancellorsville, thousands slaughtered. Fredericksburg, thousands slaughtered. Battle of the Wilderness, thousands slaughtered. He saw all this. He's a farm kid, like most of them that we're in, were farm kids. But he came back here to Martin after seeing all that. Six months later, he mysteriously dies. That's, that's pretty interesting. Uh, the 3rd Michigan, I'll talk about them real quick. They also were at the same places that the 24th was, because, again, they were with the Army of the Potomac. Um, but during Gettysburg, they were in what's referred to as the Peach Orchard. And this was a heroic story. <laughs> they uh, faced down three divisions of South Carolina infantry themselves in the Peach Orchard, which is where some of the worst... With the exception of Pickett's Charge, this was the next worst fighting was, was in the Peach Orchard. And they faced down three divisions of South Carolina infantry and defeated them. They never gave way because they were trying to break that line there to get in and flank the Union forces. If they, they were on the very end of the Union line. And if they would have been able to get in there, they would have been able to come up and flank the Union forces and Gettysburg would have had a different story. But the 3rd Michigan Infantry didn't let that happen. And one of those individuals, Samuel Andrews, uh, also buried East Martin Cemetery, uh, was a part of that. Saw that. Survived. Ended up dying in 1902. Uh, boy. Uh, William B. Chase, 13 Michigan Infantry. I've got him up here. Good night, ladies. It's early, but I'll let it slide. <laughs> uh, 13 Michigan Infantry. I talk about disease and death and famine, things like that. Uh, 70, about 70 to 75 percent of the people that died in the Civil War actually died of disease. They didn't die from, from gunshots. They died of cholera and dysentery and all these communicable diseases that were going around. Uh, William B. Uh, Chase, an example of that. He was in the 13th Michigan, and he ended up uh, dying in Louisville, Kentucky. Before they, they mustered up here in Michigan, made their way to Louisville, regrouped, he died. He just wasn't used to the communicable, communicable diseases. Probably got cholera, probably got dysentery, something along those lines. Um, and here's an example of, of uh, Philip Runkle. He was actually in the first Wisconsin, moved here to Michigan afterwards. He's buried in East Martin Cemetery. World War One. Yikes. We're not worried about the clock. Okay. So. I got, if you have to leave at 7, go ahead. I didn't really. I, I actually thought I was going to be about 40, 45 minutes. Uh, Frank B. Guide. Who's heard of Guide Memorial Park? It's not named after him. World War I. Frank B. Guide was a member of the 6th Marines. This is his actual Marine Corps helmet from World War I from the museum. This is a 100-year-old helmet. This still has the original liner in it. That's amazing. <coughs> but... Sixth Marines, and it's got the Marine Globe and Anchor on there. If you come to the museum, which I highly recommend, I'll show you an Army helmet. Looks just like this without the Globe and Anchor and without the Sixth Marine emblem on the front of it. Frank Guy, again, Sixth Marine, buried uh, New East Martin Cemetery. Uh, Sixth Marines went to Europe. Initially, they were just kind of dispersed to help kind of fill in. Their units were just filling in some holes. And then they got orders to attack a French city called Belchamp. And they said, while you're there, we want you to go ahead and take the woods that surrounds that city. The, taking the woods took over 30 days. If you studied World War I, you might have heard these woods as Bella Wood. That is a very, that is probably in Marine Corps history, that's one of the top five battles that the Marines have ever fought was in Bella Wood. In World War One, has anybody have any relatives in here that were in the Marine Corps, or heard, has anybody ever heard the Marines refer to themselves as Devil Dogs? Yeah, it's kind of the Marines. That's their thing. They, you know, 
devil dogs, uh, and they, they have a pit bull now or a bulldog that's their mascot that if you go to the different community they've got. They started that from Bellawood because the Germans said the Marines fought so fiercely, the Germans started calling them devil dogs, uh, dogs of the devil. So they took this name as a, as a, as a, as a story for them. Hey, we're devil dogs. So that, that started in Bellawood. 30-day fighting, the majority of it was bayonet on rifle and hand-to-hand -hand combat for 30 days. And then they finally kept... The battle was so fierce that the French renamed the Woods to uh, Marine Corps Brigade Woods now. <laughs> they, don't, they don't call it Bellawood anymore. They named it after the Marines after, after the war was over. Uh, additionally, I have an original... Uh, Croix de Guerre, which is a French medal awarded the 6th Marines. It's the highest award that the French can give to a foreign country, and every Marine got one of these. And this is an original one from World War I. But the Marines ended up, the 6th Marines ended up uh, receiving three Croix de Guerres by the time the, the war ended. But Frank died whose picture is hard to see there. That's taken here in Martin. Uh, he opened the standard uh, gas station where the Clark station is now. That used to be the standard, standard gas station. That was Guide's gas station. Uh, we'll talk about Guide Park a little bit later on. That's not named after Frank Guide. That's named after Robert Guide, and I'll talk about him. But fought in France. This is key, because I'm going to talk about this a little bit later. Fought in France, Bellawood, okay, in the section of... Uh, right by the German border. Next person I'm going to talk about is John Vandermolen, 16th U.S. Infantry, World War I. John Vandermolen saw in World War I, they, his unit was the very first, the 16th Inf Infantry was the very first American unit to take casualties in World War I. Uh, his unit was also in the Marne. And if you study World War I history, Battle of the Marne. That was the 16th Infantry, fought very fierce. The Marne was the beginning because the 16th Infantry, 16th Infantry took the Marne, the city of Marne. That was the beginning of the end of World War I for the Germans because they took that, took that place. Uh, do you recognize this? Does it look familiar? Nope. This, this is still here now, but if you're standing on East Martin Street here, probably in front of the daycare center, and if you're looking across the street, the Dollar General comes back to about right there right now. Okay, that house is still there. Uh, that was Vander Molen's red and white grocery store. Boyson's is right here. This is the back of Boyson's. What used to be Boyson's or Fenner Brothers or Martin Village Market, the one they tore down. Okay, this is all Dollar General's parking. Well, that's probably the side of the Dollar General building, <laughs> right there. But that was uh, one of one of three grocery stores that was here in Martin. John Vandermolen opened that up after World War One, just like uh, Frank Guybe opened up the Clark or the uh, Standard Oil gas station. He was the Standard agent for Martin. World War Two. Robert E. Guybe, ah, now you know where Guybe Park's named after. Guybe Park was, or uh, Robert Guybe was Frank Guybe's son. He was in the first, the Big Red One, uh, the U.S. Army's Big Red One. Europe, 1945, this guy here, think, now he was killed in World War II. Okay, that's, I'm going to give you the end of the story right now. He was killed in World War II. Uh, just found out tonight that his body was in Belgium, buried in Belgium for a year before the family could get it back here to Martin. Uh, he's buried in East Martin Cemetery. But Normandy, you guys are all kind of familiar with D-Day, invading the beach, you've seen it in history class, all that stuff. Uh, he landed on the beaches of Normandy, not during D-Day, but once those beaches were open, that was the access point for all the rest of the U.S. forces to come ashore. Towards the end of the war, we were moving on Germany. We were going in to invade Germany. And we needed to get across the rivers. 
Okay, the Rhine River was a big one. The thing about that is the Germans were trying to blow the bridges up to slow down the Americans and the British and the Canadians from getting in there. And the Americans and Canadians and Germans were trying to take the bridges so the Germans couldn't blow them up. Another thing the Germans had, they controlled the dams. So they would open the dams and flood the what you know open open the dams which would make the the rivers wider so now we had to take the dams robert guide there was a dam that his unit small platoon was supposed to take and they did but during it was a night and i read the account that my wife thank you my wife did a lot of work for me today talking to the guides getting this stuff got their telegram and everything when they found out about it and, and all kinds of information but they, his platoon was supposed to take this dam at night so they could stop the Germans from releasing all the water through the dam. So he was actually killed in a night firefight. They took the dam. That way, uh, you know, the U.S. did take it, but that's, he was killed in 1945. I mean, he was killed just a couple months before the war in Europe was over. It was that close. <laughs> yeah. But uh, anyway, so Robert Guy. That's what Guybe Park is named after him. Frank Guybe and his wife donated the land to build Guybe Park. That's Guybe Park today. Actually, that was just taken last year, I think. I stole that. It's one of your photos I stole. <laughs> Vietnam. One person I'm going to talk about for Vietnam. Frank Duzma Jr. Now... His story is so interwoven in modern history, it's not even funny. January 31st, 1968 is a year, a date, an exact date that a historian could look at and go in the United States, not just militarily, but politically. Today, in 2017, we're experiencing what happened on January 31st, 1968. The first Tet Offensive happened. For those of you that don't know, Tet is the Vietnamese celebration of the New Year. And it's a three-day long celebration. It's New Year's times three is what it is for the Vietnamese. There was a ceasefire because of Tet. And the North Vietnamese did an offensive on Tet that we weren't ready for. He was in a place called Way City. And the Battle of Way City in the first Tet Offensive on a date that changed our country historically was the center of the fire. The bat the Way City was the center focus of these ripples we're still filling today in 2017. Why was it so different? Because the Tet Offensive changed our country politically. There was this dynamic shift. Prior to the Tet Offensive, the Democrats were the hawks. They were all these World War II guys that were under FDR. They were the hawks. They were the ones that were rattling their sabers and wanting to go to war. Republicans were the isolationists that didn't want to go to war. Even during World War II, Republicans wanted nothing whatsoever to do with FDR's war. They reluctantly served, but they wanted nothing to do with the war. Okay? When the Tet Offensive happened at that time, Johnson, who was president, knew bad things were going to happen. And at that point in time, he wasn't a popular guy. The Democratic Party went, yeah, no, we're done with this war. The dynamic shift, the Republicans became the hawks, and the Democrats became the ones of, no, we don't want to go to war anymore. But Way City was the center of all of this. That war, that battle lasted. Now, I've read the account of that day at the compound that he was at, and I am editing it and omitting certain things on purpose. Because the accounts, actually I've read several accounts, written by people that were there. So I, I am censoring some of it just for public purposes. But in the morning, very early in the morning on January 31st, 1968, 
Frank Duzma and two other guys were on duty. And their job was to go up in the, Frank's job was to go up into one of the towers if anything happened, where they had a machine gun. And then the other two guys, one guy was in another tower and then one guy was at the gate. That was their job. They were Army, but the Marines were actually in charge of the security of the compound. And one of the accounts I read was written by the Marine captain that was there at the time, or lieutenant. So, all of a sudden, a rocket explodes in the middle of this big compound. And I've seen pictures of the compound. They're online. The Vietnamese government still using the compound now as a government area. Big cinder block, probably as tall as this ceiling wall going around the compound. And the, they said, the, the lieutenant's account said the explosion was so loud that everybody was deaf. You couldn't hear anything. And I know that for been there, done that, experienced it. He goes up into his tower along with the other guy. So they're repelling the, the Vietnamese from coming over, coming over the, the compound wall. He's credited with taking out 18 Vietnamese. Uh, his tower is hit with a rocket, lands on the top. And the explosion again so loud that he can't hear, still alive, still conscious. The second, or the lieutenant gets up to the tower to check on him, and he's hurt pretty bad. But he's still conscious and he's still fighting. He takes his rifle and starts shooting as well. The, the lieutenant gets down, the tower's hit again with another rocket. Uh, they do get medical up there, but by that time it was too late. But this guy experienced. He was 19 years old, 19 years old when he was doing that, and was just days away from being sent home. He was, he was, he was days away from being sent home. And I kind of know what his job was. He was an advisor for the Vietnamese. I did the same thing when I was in Iraq. I was an advisor. So I kind of know what the, some of the stuff, the, the, when I say some of the stuff, some of the interaction with the, with the Vietnamese people, the kind of things he had to do. But uh, he was credited with saving not only the whole compound and every American in the compound, but also credited with eliminating 18 Vietnamese um, that eventually they stopped trying to come over and they just bypassed the compound. Uh, so he, he, his actions secured the compound, saved all the American lives there. And for that, he received, and I have his medals up here. These are his actual medals that his parents received at Selfridge Air Base, um, or actually Tank Com over there at Selfridge. This is the Distinguished Service Cross. Uh, this is the medal that is just below the Medal of Honor. And I, my own, this is just Scott Kuykendall's opinion, but I truly believe he was probably put in for the Medal of Honor but the military is will downgrade medals pretty regular. And I kind of, my own prejudiced opinion is he was probably put in for the Medal of Honor, but ended up receiving the Distinguished Service Cross, which is the medal just below that. But this is, this is his actual service cross, and we've got the photo of the family of my wife's grandparents uh, standing there you know, with this general as he's handing these medals. Additionally, he received the Bronze Star for those actions, and that's an actual Bronze Star right there. You guys have probably, just in recent history with Iraq and Afghanistan, you've heard of Bronze Stars, people that get those. And this is his Purple Heart that he received for those actions. And on these medals, if you come up and look, every Purple Heart has the person's name engraved on the back of it. So just a little FYI, if you're ever at a military show or something like that and they've got a purple heart and there's no name on the back of it it's just a guy it's not not one that was ever issued to anybody it was one they probably just bought at the uniform exchange but uh so this is why we're here veterans day does that look familiar you kind of see some buildings that are there that are kind of familiar that's the old bank building right there that's a telephone exchange martin telephone exchange upstairs there by the way a little, little trivia for you. But 1918, Armistice Day. This was the end of World War I, Armistice Day. 
all of these mem all these Martin Township people joining up downtown there to celebrate the end of the war to end all wars, the Great War. And that's Armistice Day started, which eventually in the 1950s evolved into Veterans Day after World War II and Korea was just about over to honor our all veterans. Questions, comments? I'll turn the lights on so you guys can see. Sorry about going uh, over there. I honestly thought I only had about 40 minutes, but. <laughs> Has anyone in the area ever won the Congressional Medal of Honor? We've had one, yes. One Allegan County Civil War. Uh, now, the thing about the Medal of Honor back then, it was not the same medal that it is today. Uh, there were no bronze stars, silver stars, medals for merit, achievement medals. You know, I don't know if you were ever in the military, but, uh, uh, you know, what, what branch were you in? Army. Okay, Army Achievement Medals, Army yeah. Accommodation Medals. None of that stuff existed. The only two medals that existed were the Medal of Honor and the Purple Heart. So if somebody did something heroic, they got a Medal of Honor. You know, hey, there you go, you got it. It wasn't until the 20th century, you know, after World War One that Congress went, yeah, no, we're, we're not giving these, the Medal of Honor is for extreme heroism. You know, nowadays, proof in point, there's only 80 living Medal of Honor recipients, 80 living ones in the United States. Now, more were given because 80% of them get them posthumously, but living are only 80. Why? Because you never pay taxes again the rest of your life. Um, your medical coverage is 100% for the rest of your life. Your kids are automatically accepted to any military academy they want to go to. You get a lot of benefits. Uh, so not only is the, the guidance for heroism much more strict, uh, there's also more medals. Things that you would have gotten a bronze star for, you would have gotten the Medal of Honor back in the Civil War. <laughs> you know. So yes, but I, I hate to downgrade the guy that got it. He would have gotten a silver star if it was happened today. So yes, there was one. Any other questions? Lovely. Was that uh, informative? Nobody fell asleep, so that was a plus. I had my eye on you, buddy. <laughs> well, good. Okay, high school kids that want the extra credit, come up here and sign. Oh, I forgot to show this, too. This was John Vander. I ran out of time. This was John Vander Mullen's blue star that flew. Okay, the Vander Mullen house, if you go up here to the light and hang a right, the house right behind Dollar General, that was the Vander Mullen house. This hung in the window of that house. And it's got his name on it, and then the 16th Infantry and all that stuff. 16th U.S. Infantry. And that would have just been on display while he was serving. Correct. That shows everybody in the neighborhood that we've got someone that's serving in the military overseas in combat in this house. Much like today, if you see him in people's houses. All right, you guys get over here inside. Thanks, I forgot I had that there.